Mr. Harari, nice to meet you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, why do you think are your books so successful? <laughs> uh, partly I have a very good team that helps me. You know, there are many very good books that few people ever heard about. I'm lucky to have a good team to support me. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I think the answer for a real, real need, we are living in a global world. Our future will be impacted, will be shaped by events all over the world, not just in, in one country. And my books give a global view of the past, of the future of humankind, and of the present. So I think these are the two main reasons. Yeah. Um, you'll be talking to more than 5,000 people in Antwerp. Um, you've just come back from Davos, the World Economic Forum. Um, do you think the CEOs and captains of industry and politicians in Davos got the urgency of your plea? I don't know. Let, let's see what happens in the next uh, few months or years. What do you expect to happen? What should they be doing? I think they should focus m more than they do now on the three big challenges for humankind in the 21st century, which are the threat of nuclear war, uh, the reality of ecological collapse, and uh, the threat of technological disruption, especially what artificial intelligence and biotechnology are mm -hmm. going to do to our species, uh, to the job market, to the political system, to the life of, of every person. I would say these are the three major challenges and I would hope that politicians and business people and everybody would pay more, more attention to them. Okay, we'll go into that. Um, but first I want to establish uh, the context uh -huh. um, based on your books. You say um, humans are distinct from other animals, so to speak, um, because of their capacity for storytelling. Yes. How is that an advantage for our species? Well, first we need to understand that we rule the planet because we are the only mammals capable of cooperating in very large numbers. And all our ma major achievements as a species are not the result of individual abilities, mm -hmm. but the result of large-scale cooperation. Whether it's building the pyramids or flying to the moon or deciphering DNA, it's always the result of cooperation between really millions of people. And to get millions of people to cooperate, you need a good story. And this is what chimpanzees and elephants and dolphins can't really do. They cooperate on the basis of uh, intimate acquaintance, one with the other. Humans can cooperate with complete strangers they never met before, provided they all believe in the same yeah. story. It's very clear in the case of religion, Mm -hmm. But it's the same with economics. Yeah, you uh, say Google is a story, in yeah, fact, co corporations. Or money. Yeah, you ask a lawyer, what is a corporation? I mean, a corporation has no body, you can't see it, you can't touch it, it's not the factories, it's not the... What is it? Mm -hmm. So lawyers will tell you corporations are legal fictions. They are stories told by lawyers, which are also story storytellers. And as long as enough people believe in the story, it works. Yeah. And it's the what, same with money. What yeah. makes one story more believable than another or more successful than another? That's one of the biggest questions of history and there is no kind of magic formula. Um, it's certainly not truth. Some of the most successful stories in human history were not necessarily true stories. Mm -hmm. Again, if you look, for example, at religion, then even religious people would agree that all religions, except one, are fictions. The exception is, of course, my religion. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very common in history to find millions, even hundreds of millions of people believing in a story which others would think is not just fictional but actually ridiculous, but is still enough um, to, to shape the world. Yeah, nationalism was on the rise. Nationalism is a story. Each nationalism yeah, each, in its Each own. nation has its own story. Usually I would say that a leader that would tell the whole truth about uh, his or her nation or country will never win any elections. Because the truth is usually complicated, is usually inconvenient, unpleasant, has all kinds of dark sides. Mm -hmm. um, and that's usually people don't like it very much. They want to have a more, an, a nicer view of themselves. And I don't think that nationalism is really on the rise. Maybe in the last few years you see a little 
a movement of, of, of greater uh, uh, nationalistic uh, uh, emotions, but you look at a at, 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 uh, level of decades and centuries, nationalism today, certainly in Europe, is far, far weaker than it was a century ago when Europeans were killing each other by the million over Budget national uh, mm -hmm. clashes. If you look at Brexit, for example, then for me as a historian, the most amazing thing about Brexit is how peaceful it is. As far as I know, only one person lost her life. Joe Cox. Yeah, just before the, the, the Brexit vote. And you know, you had so many emotions and clashes and disagreements. No violence, almost no violence. Mm -hmm. So, and Catalonia was made back to differ. Um, Catal even in Catalonia, of, of course, there was a much more violence than in, in Britain over Brexit. But even there, if you compare uh, the level of violence or the number of casualties, again, I'm not sure if I, I know that hundreds were injured. I don't know if anybody was actually killed. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you compare that to the Spanish Civil War, you compare that to the wars in the 18th century uh, in Spain, then level of violence is much, much lower. You look, I don't know, at Italy. So, you know, a century ago, Italy entered the First World War to conquer a few pieces of territory which it thought were Italian, and it lost half a million people killed and about a million injured. So now, are you saying nationalism isn't a problem at all? In and by itself? Hey, it depends what we do is not. In itself, if we understand nationalism correctly, it's, it's a very good thing. You know, some people imagine that nationalism is about hating foreigners, mm -hmm. and that's very bad. It causes wars and the persecution of minorities and so forth. But nationalism really is about loving your compatriots. And if you understand nationalism in that sense, first of all, it doesn't necessarily lead to war. Sometimes in order to take care of your compatriots, you need to cooperate with foreigners. So I think in the 21st century, good nationalists should also be globalists. Because if you really care about people in your country and you want to protect them from climate change, from dangerous technologies, you must cooperate with foreigners. You need to upscale, foreigners. as it were. Yeah. yeah. Um, what um, makes a story falter, unravel? There is no clear formula. I mean, th this is what differentiates, I don't know, history from physics. In physics, you have equations and you can predict if you take this and you take that, this will be the result. In history, what kind of stories and movements and religions succeed and when they fail, so difficult to predict. Uh, you know, look at the rise of Christianity in the Roman Empire. Of all the different religions that competed in the Roman Empire, in the second and third centuries, um, there, there is no clear reason or uh, that you can say this is why mm -hmm. Christianity became the dominant religion and all the other religions that were around at the time, uh, Mithraism and Manichaeanism and so many others, they failed. It's if we kind of rewind the story, the, the film of history and press play a hundred times, I think Christianity would have taken over the Roman Empire maybe just twice. It was very accidental. Uh, it's the same, I don't know, with the communist revolution mm -hmm. in, in Russia a century ago. In 1914, if you told people that in three years the Bolsheviks will take over, they would think you're completely crazy. Russia was an empire of about 180 million people. You had about 20,000 members. In, the Bolshevik, in Lenin's Bolshevik party. That's it. And the, the, there was a chain of events that led to Bolshevism taking over Russia. But, but this it can only be explained accidental. afterwards yeah. by historians when looking you look, at the facts. When you look after, after the event, everybody is, oh, this is so He's obvious. He's an expert. <laughs> you, know, if you even look at the election of Donald Trump in the US. If a couple of tens of thousands of people in Pennsylvania and Ohio voted differently, mm -hmm. um, everybody would look back and would say, well, these Republicans were crazy to put such a person as, as, as candidate. And everybody would have theories and explanations why it was a foregone conclusion that they would lose the election. But now, because he won, then many people have these theories that this was kind of inevitable and represents a shift 
in the spirit of, G of the age or, or whatever. So it I all depends on the angle and on the looking back, really, um, whatever the explanation is after the event. Yeah, and after the event, it's very easy to explain anything that happens. Mm -hmm. Um, in mo many cases, not always, but in many cases, history is quite accidental and it's very difficult to say in advance which competing stories, ideologies, religions would, would carry the day. Okay. Um, not only um, do we exchange stories, build stories that unite us uh, in a way, we ourselves are stories is what you claim. Um, we are fictions. How, how does that work? That everybody tells his or her own personal story, which very often is very, very far from the reality of who I actually am. Not just on the biological level, mm -hmm. but even on the psychological level or, or the history of my life. You know, you, you take a few, uh, a, a few pieces of experiences you actually had you sometimes interpret them in a new way. You add all kinds of uh, fictional details that you invent or you hear from other people or you, you saw build on a television. Narrative. And you build a narrative for yeah. your life and you start believing, oh, this is who I am. Is that a problem at all? Sometimes it is. If, if people have a very misguided perception of, of who they are, it's impossible, just as it is impossible to build a corporation or a nation without a national mythology or a corporate story, so also people can't really live without some kind of personal story. Mm -hmm. But I think in all these cases, it's still important to be able to differentiate reality from fiction. So if they go, grow too far apart, we can notice that, hey, we are starting to live a fantasy. And also very often these stories can cause a lot of suffering, whether to individual people, who become attached to some story about themselves which is not true and which causes them a lot of suffering or on the level of an entire nation can cause a nation to go to war, for example, because people believe in some national mythology. And in these cases, it's very important to be able to differentiate fiction from reality. Remember that in the end, suffering is real, whereas these stories are just our creation. So we have to be able to step out of the stories, yeah. the bigger ones, and the ones we tell ourselves about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but then you go deeper and you say, well, um, you refer to suffering, but you say emotions are sophisticated biochemical Algorithm. algorithms. Yeah. Um, I don't know what to think of that. But this so is, is there no me then? Am I just a collection of biochemical uh, reactions and... Neurons firing off on one another? Th th there is much more, which is uh, consciousness and experiences. We, are, we understand very well, not very well, relatively well compared to previous times, the, the body and the brain and the neurobiological processes and all the, the biochemistry. Almost. Yes, but how does all that create subjective experiences of pain and pleasure and love and hate? we don't really understand. It's, I would say, the greatest lacuna in an understanding not just of life, but even of the universe. Mm -hmm. The greatest riddle science faces in the 21st century is the riddle of consciousness. Now, I wouldn't jump from here back to all kinds of mystical notions. Oh, science doesn't understand consciousness, so it must mean that we have a soul, just like the Bible says or whatever. No. You don't believe we have a soul? As, as, a, as a scientist, if I don't understand something, I think the most important thing is to be honest, not to, come, not to start inventing some nice story, but to say, we don't really understand this. We need further research. There are many things we do understand. Mm -hmm. We now understand the connection between brain activities and emotions much, much better than, than a century ago. We can look at what's happening in a person's brain and predict with a very high level of certainty what that person is feeling, uh, we can manipulate it by changing either the biochemistry in the brain or even directly uh, making neurons fire or not fire, we can cause people mm -hmm. to change what they feel. So uh, there is a very close link there 
But we should also be humble and say we don't understand everything. We still don't understand. Yeah. How is it that when billions of neurons fire, how does that translate into the subjective experience of pain or love? We don't understand that. But, as you say, we can manipulate some of it. Yes. We are hackable humans. Is hackable animals, say. even. Hackable yeah. animals, yeah. That's not a very reassuring thought. Who, who might manipulate us and how far can this be taken? Um, there are many dangers here. As we, in order to, to, to hack a human being means to understand you better than you understand yourself, to know more about you, and whoever can do that can there not just predict what you will do and choose, but also manipulate you. This is what advertisers do and, and what Facebook and Google is after, but yeah. maybe also um, oh, Russia tried in yeah. the so, election you know, scandal. Throughout history, people always wanted to do it, predict and manipulate what other people are doing and thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we have far more sophisticated tools than ever before. To hack a human being, you need a lot of biological knowledge, a lot of data, and a lot of computing power to make sense of all that. It's all there now. And in the past it wasn't, now it's there. Now at least some corporations and governments have enough data and computing power to know me better than I know myself to know my political uh, 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 views, to know my sexual preferences, my deepest fears and desires. And that's a huge danger because it means that uh, not only you can manipulate people, you can actually, for the first time, build a totalitarian regime that can follow the entire population all the time and know not just what people are doing, but even what people are feeling and thinking and anticipate their behavior. You speak of digital dictatorship. Yes. Um, is that what is going on or happening or coming into being in China, for example? Would you go as far? It's, it's not there yet anywhere in the world because still the technology is not per perfected. It's not, but we are making huge steps in that direction, not just in China, but in many other places around the world, also in democratic countries, like my own home country of Israel, which has basically the, the biggest, one of the biggest laboratories for surveillance technologies in the world is in the occupied territories. Uh, and the technology developed there is then sold to all kinds of regimes all over the world, like the latest... Um, in Saudi Arabia, in, in for Saudi example. In Saudi Arabia, like, as, as far, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know personally, mm -hmm. but publications say that the program the, that the Saudis used to hack Jeff Bezos's uh, phone was Israeli technology. Mm -hmm. And part so of the warming relations between Israel and these countries is because they wanted the technology. And the same with the US. Um, th there are people who describe China as the center of state surveillance, but the US is the center of surveillance capitalism. And uh, having a corporation know more about you than you know about yourself could be as dangerous as having a government. Is it in. still possible to do something to change that as an individual or as a state, as a, I don't know? As an individual, it's, it's limited. I mean, the best thing you can do as an individual is get to know yourself better because it's basically a, a race. Who knows you best in the world? Uh, if the better you know yourself, you're better able to protect yourself because then it's more difficult for these corporations or governments to use your weaknesses against you. Mm -hmm. Like with fake news, fake news work to a large extent by exploiting your pre-existing biases. If you already have a bias against, say, immigrants, you will far more easily believe a fake news story about, I don't know, a gang of immigrants raping local women. So, but how do you get to that point? Is that a matter of education, of awareness? Of so, on the individual level, uh, there are many different methods. I personally, I do meditation. I do Vipassana meditation. I meditate two hours every day to get to know myself better, to stay in the game. Other people go to psychotherapy, they use arts, people use sports, hiking in nature as a means to just get to know who they really are. Mm -hmm. It's becoming more and more important. But ultimately, we need to act on the political level. 
individuals cannot do it by themselves. Yeah, because it, it can really change society, is Completely. what you're saying. It's not just it can lead to new classes, in a way, where there's a super elite and a superfluous class that's left behind by yeah, I mean, the uh, advances in technology, artificial uh -huh. intelligence as C well. Completely. I mean, the, the, the amount of data now and the sophistication of AI that analyzes the data is such that this is now the key for controlling countries and economies. So if we don't take action and political action to make sure that uh, the benefits of AI are distributed between everybody, and nobody, no single corporation or a small group accumulates all the data and all the power that comes with it, if we don't take this kind of action, we could see the greatest inequality that ever existed. Inequality both within countries and also between countries. Because we now have an, an AI arms race between in, in the world. You know, like in the 19th century, that mm -hmm. a few countries industrialized first and then conquered the whole world. It can happen again with AI. At present, China and the US are leading in the AI arms race. And if we aren't careful, we will see an, a new wave of kind of data colonialism that many countries become just data colonies. If you have enough data, you don't need to send soldiers. Just imagine what the situation in 20 years in a, in a country when somebody in Beijing or in San Francisco knows the entire medical and personal history of every judge and every politician and every journalist. And they know their, uh, the, 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 again, the uh, sexual escapades and the corrupt dealings and the mental weaknesses mm -hmm. of every politician, every judge, every army officer, every business person. In so such a total situation, control. you don't need to send an army. It's already a data colony. Yeah. So a third world war, is that still possible in your view? And if so, what would that look like? I think it's unlikely in the near future, especially because it would probably lead to the annihilation of, of humankind. But if you look at what's happening now in, in the nuclear field, people think, oh, nuclear war, this was some, something in the 1960s or 1970s. Yeah, it was off the table until and Iran and the US yeah, got Yeah, but now it's, it's coming back. And the danger with, you know, you, you now see a, a American isolationism and also British isolationism and the uh, disruption and disintegration of a rule-based international system. And this could ignite a new and even more dangerous nuclear arms race between many more countries. Just think about, say, Germany. If Germany no longer can trust the USA and Britain to uh, uh, back Germany in case of confrontation with the Russians, then the Germans will say, hey, we now need nuclear weapons of our own. We can no longer trust the Americans. The Japanese and the South Koreans, the same. The Saudis and the Turks, the same. So the big cost, I, I listened to, president, to the US president's speech at Davos, mm -hmm. and you know, it was basically a, an election speech to people back in Ohio. What was the message to the world leaders, politicians and business leaders gathered in Davos? The basic message was, America first, we just do what's good for un, our interests and you should do the same. Now, maybe in economics, there are also economic problems with that. But you think in political and military terms, what does it mean? Does it mean the Germans need their own nuclear weapons? It means the Japanese need their own nuclear weapons because they can't trust America anymore? It's very, it's very dangerous. Own. There's uh, the third element we uh, should get into. You refer to Davos. Greta Thunberg was there as well. Uh -huh. Climate change. Yeah. One big story that everybody could, should maybe rally around. And yeah. yet, no such unity. There is a lack of a good story about mm -hmm. climate change is what you say. How come? Um, it's much more difficult to get people interested in climate change than say in terrorism. Maybe almost for, for biological reasons. Uh, until very recently, climate was not our responsibility. We couldn't control and change the climate. You know, when we were apes in the African savanna, of course we cared about the climate. If there is drought, it's very bad. But we are not programmed by evolution 
to think that we can do something about it. So, you know, if, if uh, somebody comes from the opposite tribe to kill us, okay, we can do something about it. It immediately gets our attention. Mm -hmm. But the climate, pff, that's beyond, be, uh, above our pay, uh, our pay level, as they, as they say. And we still and, feel and like we still that. feel that way. So, in a, in a way, you see a headline, uh, terrorist attack kills five, immediately our attention is drawn. You see a headline, new research indicates that CO2 levels in the, and you're already lost. So we can't so help it really is what no, you're saying. We need, I mean, we are sophisticated uh, uh, beings. We can uh, understand that these things are now within our power. They are our responsibility. If we do nothing, the results in the near future would be terrible. And I would say that the most important thing is to realize we can do something. Some people think, well, it's too late. Mm -hmm. And what do you want us to do? Go back living in caves? But the magic number, I would say, is something like 2%. 2% of global GDP is enough to deal with the climate crisis. If the world community invested just 2% of global GDP, we solve it. Now, 2% of decision. global GDP is still a lot. It's basically the defense budget of, of the world. The average uh, amount countries spend on defense is 2%. Uh, we spend much more on education and health and healthcare. But if we spend so much on armies, we can spend as much on saving the ecosystem. And you know, if there was a world war, we would spend much more than 2%. So much, it's much really more. a choice. Actually, you, you do believe in um, rationality and taking responsibility for ourselves and yeah. getting to know ourselves and then working together towards a, a, a rational and better outcome. Um, what gives you hope or um, the belief that, that people are actually willing and capable to do so? Or are you pessimist? I try to be a realist. I mean, you know, capable, we are certainly are capable. We have what it takes to deal with all the major challenges mm -hmm. if there is the will. That, that's the big problem. Very often, the motivation is lacking. Um, but and you as a historian, what do you think is, your, is the impact of your work um, on, on all the future developments? Or what do you hope it is? I try to change the public conversation and focus the debate on what I think are the most important challenges. Again, on nuclear war, on the ecological crisis, and on the uh, dangers of disruptive technology, mm -hmm. especially AI and bioengineering. I think this should dominate, you know, like every election campaign, this should be uh, in the focus. At present, you see that too many election campaigns, uh, they focus on things, again, like terrorism, like immigration, like the structure of the EU, trade agreements, which are important. I mean, we do need to think about it and take care of it. But this should not be the number one, number two subjects in, in elections. The, the three existential challenges we are facing, this, they should receive the center stage because, you know, immigration won't destroy human civilization. Terrorism can't destroy human civilization. Trade agreements, if trade is like this or like this, it wouldn't destroy human civilization. But nuclear war and ecological collapse and the rise of AI, they could destroy human civilization. You're going around now, we mentioned Davos among others and, and speaking to great audiences. Um, what's next? Are you still writing? Uh, do you have time to read and think and yeah, on I, the I, next steps? I, I have time, some time at least. Uh, <laughs> we are working as an entire team really on uh, several projects. Uh, I'm working on a children's book aimed at children's age 9, 10, 11, mm -hmm. also kind of uh, uh, trying to explain the history of the world, but in a, an accessible way. We are working on a, on a graphic novel, also to reach a different audience on a, on a uh, TV show. So th the whole idea is, you know, only a, a certain part of the population read books. But yeah. it's important that everybody is involved. Things like uh, the rise of artificial intelligence, they will impact everybody. You think arti artificial intelligence will uh, prevail over us will 
I'll no, drink I, us? I, I, don't, I don't want it to sound like a science fiction scenario of robots rebelling against humans. It's very unlikely to happen, certainly not in the near future. We are talking about far more primitive AI, not the kind you see in the movies. Primitive AI is enough to completely disrupt the economy, to replace humans in many jobs. You don't need the super AI from the science fiction movies. For, to replace human drivers, even human doctors in diagnosing disease, we are very close to it. Mm -hmm. So there will be, be new jobs, of course, but this raises a lot of questions about how do you retrain people? Whether you invest the profits from the AI in retraining people, maybe in other countries. You know, part of the danger of the AI arms race, with the USA and China leading the race, is that the AI revolution will create immense wealth in a few countries which are leading this revolution, whereas other countries could completely collapse. So we need a kind of global safety net that if, you know, what happens once it's cheaper to produce textiles and cars in California than in Mexico? We are quite close to that point. Uh, what happens to the millions of workers in Mexico that lose their job? Now, the Mexican government doesn't have the resources to re in, re, uh, retrain them and to build new kinds of sophisticated, sophisticated industry. Would the US government raise taxes on US corporations and send the money to Mexico to retrain the workers there? Doesn't seem so. Mm -hmm. So what will happen to them? These are the, the, the really central issues of the day. Lots of lots of questions. Um, how godlike do you feel as a writer? <laughs> <laughs> looking over everything that's going on, trying to synthesize it in these wonderful books? I think or do you feel frustrated and say, no, come on, listen to me? No, I think that you know, it, it takes time to change the, 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 the public conversation. I think in general, all humans should realize that with regard to the planet and to the other animals, we are already gods. We already hold the destiny of the other animals and of the planet in our hands. So far we have been very irresponsible gods and also quite dissatisfied gods. It's amazing to see this disparity between the enormous power we have accumulated and uh, the fact that we are still relatively dissatisfied with life. We always want more, we want to yeah. live longer, be younger and so on and so we on. We just don't know how to translate all that power into a happier life. And that's very, very dangerous. And it's been like that throughout history. Humans are very good in accumulating power. They are very bad in translating power into happiness. And uh, as we accumulate more power, the danger inherent in this is, is bigger and bigger. And so that's what you want us to think about. Thank you very much, Mr. Harari. Thank you.